SIBO may be responsible for up to 80% of IBS cases, but what exactly is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? My name is Bella and I'm a functional nutritionist and founder of the Functional Gut Health Clinic, where SIBO is our main focus and a topic very close to my heart. SIBO was actually responsible for my own IBS diagnosis and the healing journey I went on over 10 years ago. The lack of understanding and support back then is what really inspired me to blog about SIBO and then create the Functional Gut Health Clinic. We've now helped thousands of clients identify and overcome SIBO and so I wanted to make a video series to help you get a really good understanding of what SIBO is, how to identify it and how to get rid of it. We're going to walk through the different types of SIBO and typical symptoms that come with them, how they negatively impact the structure and function of the small intestine, and the two main issues we see with SIBO that cause you symptoms. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is an accumulation or overgrowth of commensal gut bacteria in the small intestine. And commensal bacteria are normal gut bacteria, not pathogens or bad bugs. So really simply, SIBO is an overgrowth of normal bacteria in the small intestine. The reason that this is not normal is because generally the small intestine has only a small amount of bacteria in it. It's not designed to have a lot of bacteria. It's the large intestine that's designed to have a lot of bacteria living there. The bacteria themselves are not pathogenic or bad bacteria. It's not your typical bad bugs like Salmonella or Campylobacter, for example. It's just normal or commensal bacteria that's accumulated or overgrown in the wrong place, being the small intestine. I think of it a little bit like bees in a beehive. Bees are supposed to live in a beehive, right? Working together to create honey, make baby bees, and then supporting the plants around them. But if we get a swarm of bees that end up in our living room, we've got a problem. And the normal function of our household gets disrupted by this swarm of bees. There's nothing wrong with bees in a beehive, but living room bee overgrowth is going to cause us some issues that need to be addressed. Do you get the analogy? Like I'm not usually great at them. So let me explain again. The small intestine is like the living room. Its structure and how it functions will be impacted by the swarm of bees or the overgrowth of bacteria. But the beehive or the large intestine doesn't because it's designed to house such large numbers of bees. So how much bacteria is too much bacteria in the small intestine? Recent studies define the diagnosis of SIBO as anything greater than 1,000 colony forming units or CFU of bacteria in a tiny fluid sample of one milliliter taken from the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. In earlier studies, which you might have seen, it was thought that between 10,000 and 100,000 CFU was normal. But as with most of the science of gut health, it has recently been updated. And this update has been so helpful because we know clients can get really symptomatic with thousands of bacteria in the small intestine. So this makes sense with what we see in clinic. All right, let's jump into the anatomy. I love this part, so I hope you can get excited about it too. The human body is incredible. For anyone who has had SIBO, knowing the numbers of bacteria isn't very helpful. What we really want to know is what impact these overgrown bacteria are having on our body. Let's just take a step back and have a quick look at the anatomy of the small intestine so that you can understand the impact that SIBO can have and the symptoms it causes. So the GI tract starts with the mouth and the esophagus, which leads into the stomach and then the small intestine. The small intestine isn't actually small at all. It's around six to seven meters long, which is pretty hard to imagine all tucked up in there. It's so long that we break it down further into three parts. At the top, we have the duodenum in the middle. It's called the jejunum and at the end, or well, the last part, it's called the ileum. After the ileum, we have the ileocecal valve. This is the valve that separates the small and large intestine. Then we have the large intestine all the way through to the rectum. So just remember that the small intestine is made up of the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Let's zoom in some more and cover off the microanatomy. This is important, I promise. I'll bring it all together after this. If we zoom into the lining on the inside of the small intestine, we can see the villi, which are those finger-like projections from the small intestine wall. They look like this with lots of surface area, 
because we need lots of space to absorb nutrients from our food. These villi are the body's very smart space-saving technique so that we only need six to seven meters of small intestine, not more. If we zoom in even further and look at the outside surface of one of those little villi, we find tiny hairs called the microvilli, which are also called the brush border. You might have heard of that term, brush border. This is where the magic happens. As I said before, the key here is that all of these villi and microvilli are designed to increase the surface area of the small intestine so that we can absorb more nutrients from the foods we eat as they pass through the system. Okay, two more concepts, stick with me. We have the fingers or the villi covered in the tiny little hairs, the microvilli or the brush border. The next thing that we're going to zoom in to look at now is the single cell layer that covers the surface of the villi called the epithelial cells or the epithelium. This is the layer that gets damaged when we have a leaky gut and more about this in a bit. Okay, last concept. There is a protective layer over the top of the microvilli called the glycocalyx which is essential for us to be able to absorb nutrients through the microvilli. Digestive enzymes, including the enzymes that are really important for breaking down carbohydrates and histamine in our food, sit within this layer and extend through the glycocalyx and into the microvilli. And so why this anatomy is so important for us to understand is that with SIBO, we can get a couple of things happening first. The overgrowth of bacteria here can damage the lining of the small intestine and it can really reduce the amount of enzymes being produced in the glycocalyx that help us break down things like carbohydrates and histamine. That damage to the small intestine lining is what we call increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Basically, the epithelial cells that are kind of a skin on the villi line the small intestine and have these tight junctions that hold them together and they're supposed to let nutrients through. But with leaky gut, these tight junctions aren't working properly, and so undigested nutrients and other things that shouldn't be able to can pass through that lining and into our bloodstream. This can set off our immune system and cause it to attack those undigested nutrients and triggers a whole inflammatory cascade that if it goes on for long enough can lead to food sensitivities and even autoimmune conditions. So in simple terms, too many bacteria in the small intestine will interfere with digestion and absorption, which is a problem because that's the main role of the small intestine, to digest food and absorb nutrients. And this is why we see a ton of malabsorption in SIBO, basically foods not being properly digested and nutrients not being absorbed well enough. SIBO can cause two main issues that we see with our clients. Firstly, bacterial fermentation. Because food isn't being properly digested, particularly your carbohydrates, and because these carbs are sitting around, they get fermented by overgrown bacteria, and we get a lot of gas produced by the fermentation process. And this excess gas production shows up as bloating, gas, pain, irregular bowel movements, and a whole range of other digestive symptoms that would traditionally get diagnosed as IBS. Second is leaky gut. If you have SIBO, we know that the overgrown bacteria can cause inflammation and damage to the gut lining. Clients who have SIBO and leaky gut may experience the immune response type symptoms. We see a lot of vitamin deficiencies, histamine intolerance, skin conditions, fatigue, brain symptoms, malnutrition and weight loss, and the list goes on. We'll do a deep dive into these in another video. The other big thing that you want to know is what type of bacteria you have overgrowing in your small intestine. Let's talk about the three types of SIBO. They're named after the gas that they produce. We have hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide as the three different types of SIBO. So the first type is what we call hydrogen dominant SIBO. The main bacteria that are overgrown for SIBO H are Escherichia coli species, Klebsiella pneumonia and Klebsiella aerogenes. The Klebsiella species were shared in 2023. And until really recently, we actually thought it was just about the overall amount of bacteria in the small intestine. Now we understand it's specific bacteria causing the overgrowth, which means that our interventions can be even more targeted in terms of the antimicrobials that we might use. The second type of SIBO used to be called methane dominant SIBO. But it turns out the overgrown microbes aren't actually bacteria at all. They're actually a single-celled organism known as archaea. 
and the main archaea species responsible for the excessive production of methane gas in the small intestine is Methanobrevibacter smithii. So because these aren't bacteria, and because we're learning that these methanogens can also overgrow in the large intestine as well, it doesn't make much sense to keep calling it methane-dominant SIBO. Let's reveal the SIBO M name change. It's now known as intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or EMO for short. Now, the third type of overgrowth is called hydrogen sulfide SIBO, or SIBO H2S. The bacteria responsible for excess hydrogen sulfide gas were discovered in 2022. They are Fusobacterium barium and Desulfovibrio. And so while there is a lot of symptom overlap between the three types of overgrowth, the most common symptom being bloating very soon after eating, what we generally see clinically is that hydrogen gas is often linked with diarrhea, methane gas with constipation, and hydrogen sulfide can be with a mix of either diarrhea or constipation. But we have also seen a handful of clients who have SIBO H, who are constipated, and emo, who have diarrhea. The gut is a complex place, people. We'll dive into the details on SIBO signs and symptoms in the next video, but this is the basic breakdown to get you started. It's also important to note here that we can get elevations in more than one gas. So clients might have an overgrowth of both hydrogen producing bacteria and methane producing archaea, or maybe even all three gases, although this has been pretty rare clinically for us. Now you're probably wondering where these bacteria or archaea come from. They can come from the food we eat, entering the GI tract via the mouth and getting stuck in the small intestine. They can come from an overgrowth of the small amount of bacteria that actually live in the small intestine. And then we have the possibility of back migration, that bacteria and archaea from the large intestine migrate back up into the small intestine. What's key here is that the bacteria are not being cleared out of the small intestine as they should be. Whether they came from the mouth or from the large intestine, they should be being moved down and out of the small intestine. And the problem with SIBO is that this isn't happening. Bacteria and archaea are getting stuck in the small intestine, causing damage and fermentation. So clients get symptoms. We'll talk about the most common causes of altered motility in the small intestine in another video. Now that you understand what exactly SIBO is, in the next video, we'll explore in detail the signs and symptoms of the three different types of SIBO and how to know if SIBO might be the actual cause of your IBS symptoms.